Mahaya Hia, the director of the Carnegie Middle East, the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. Thank you for joining us today for this panel on uh, the question of uh, refugee return in Syria um, and the challenges surrounding this return. As we all know, the growing crisis in Ukraine has been creating, has created an additional millions of refugees, particularly in Europe. Um, this has created significant pressure on aid budgets that were already quite stretched by COVID-19, but also with dwindling political bandwidth uh, across most donor countries, most, most of Europe. Uh, all of these issues are likely to have a knock-on impact uh, on Syria's more than 6.5 million refugees and more than 6 million internally displaced persons. There are lots of concerns as to what this means for Syria's refugees, as well as, of course, other refugees in the region, but Syria's refugee population is the largest uh, at this point. Uh, particularly, this is a particular significance because as Syria entered the conflict enters its 11th year, conditions inside the country and across the region continue to deteriorate with push factors uh, leading to increasing internal displacement, uh, sorry, leading to additional displacement, uh, conditions in host countries are worsening, uh, whereas uh, within Syria, as I said, they're getting, uh, either they're, they're unchanged or they're getting worse in many uh, aspects. For example, in host countries, we're hearing a lot of reports documenting the abuse of returnees, uh, but also in, uh, sorry, of refugees, and uh, there are multiple reports documenting the abuse of returnees in Syria. Conditions there remain quite unsuitable. In any case, to, to have this discussion and to elucidate the broader points uh, of the challenges around refugee return, uh, we have a stellar lineup today. I'm going to introduce the speakers as I come to them. I will begin first with my colleague, Arménac uh, Tokomagian, who's a non-resident scholar at the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. Um, Arménac, could you please frame for us the situation in Syria at the moment in terms of the conflict, the humanitarian situation and the security situation, particularly the changes we are seeing in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, yes, absolutely, Maha. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone, and thanks for your attendance and time. Uh, I think that's that's a, a brilliant question uh, to start with because we are uh, certainly facing a, a, a perhaps an important turning point in the in the Syrian conflict. Uh, what if I quickly recap what is the situation in Syria since uh, 2018 and 9, and then I conclude with that uh, question in, in two, three minutes. Sure. Um, I think uh, uh, since we're talking about refugee return, perhaps uh, 2018 is a good uh, starting point. In 2018, we had a situation uh, where the regime, with the help of Russia and Iran, managed to recapture a lot of territory in, in Syria. And back then, Russia took the lead in, uh, in the question of refugee return. The bargain in the nutshell, was, or the Russian bargain in the nutshell, was that uh, let's uh, reconstruct Syria with Western funds, normalize with, uh, with Assad, and in return, they would facilitate a, a refugee return. Uh, without going to many details, I think this failed. Uh, the, this approach failed back then. And uh, specifically, when uh, when the West uh, was against uh, any such bargain, and also imposed uh, tough sanctions on uh, on Assad, and the question of reconstruction became quite unlikely in 2019 and 20. Uh, so si since then, uh, since then, the situation overall has has deteriorated. Uh, let's take two angles. Uh, uh, security and uh, and economy. Uh, so the overall security situation in 2018 has uh, uh, there were several changes, mixed changes. On the front lines, war and violence has receded because uh, the the battlefronts uh, were reduced and we saw more calm front lines between the uh, the regime, the opposition, and the uh, uh, Kurdish-dominated uh, democratic forces. 
uh, as well as we saw change in the security policy of the of the Syrian regime in 2018. We witnessed some withdrawals of checkpoints, maybe easing uh, security control in certain areas uh, of uh, uh, of Syria. Nevertheless, overall, overall, I think the situation is is uh, pretty bad. And anecdotal examples even suggest that uh, we have higher criminality, for instance, higher chaos, uh, lack of uh, order and and uh, law inform enforcement, uh, for instance. Uh, um, uh, trafficking and uh, production of drugs. So I think overall the situation has has gone worse. But the economy economy I think has done even 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 worse. Uh, so since 2018 we have a I mean near economic uh, collapse, especially after 2019-20 Caesar Act, the liquidity crisis in in Lebanon, ten years of war and corruption uh, in Syria. Have have really uh, have really harmed the country. Uh, just give give one example to to illustrate the uh, uh, change, uh, both in security and economy. So, for instance, in 2015, according to opposition sources, Syrian National uh, Syrian Network for Human Rights, there was about 12,000 uh, arbitrary detentions in Syria, whereas in 2021 the number was around 2,000. So we see that there is change in the in the security uh, situation, but in the economy, uh, in 2019, for instance, we uh, the average income of Syrian families was almost the same as the average expenditure. So Syrian families uh, earned some uh, uh, 100,000 Syrian pounds and spent 100,000 Syrian pounds. Today they earn around 300,000 Syrian pounds, but they, uh, they need to spend around 450,000 Syrian pounds. So this illustrates how, how bad is the uh, economic uh, situation. Concluding with, with your question, uh, Maha, uh, I think the Ukrainian war either has done harm or promises to do more harm on the, on the long run. Uh, so, for instance, we will have we are witnessing increased fuel prices, and we know that in Syria there is a major uh, energy crisis. Uh, we are witnessing increase in food and uh, and particularly wheat uh, uh, prices, and we know that again in Syria faces a tremendous challenge in, in this regard. We hear worrying reports that uh, uh, that aid there's there might be some aid diversion from Syria to uh, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, one particular worrying aspect is the cr the um, uh, cross border of uh, Babel Hawa, mm. which will either be renewed or not in uh, in in summer in in July, and the bad U.S. Uh, Russian relations is is quite worrying. We might we might see a, a closure of that border. Although opposition areas are perhaps a bit better off than the regime held areas, but I think that would be a, a major blow. Let, let me just build on this a little bit. Um, I mean, some people are saying that the violence is now reduced clearly from what you're describing, it is not. And that even though Syria is kind of divided into three zones of influence, if you like, um, that because of that, somehow the situation is more stable and it's talk, time to talk about early recovery and refugee return. Do you think that is true? And linked to that, what you just described, if the cross-border aid delivery is not renewed in July, what kind of impact would that be? Um, given that we're all aware of the extent to which the regional situation is also shifting, we're seeing new alliances emerge. Uh, President Bashar al-Assad was received in the UAE not too long ago in what seems like an increasing push to normalize uh, and to use quotes, bring Syria back into the Arab fold. So all of these are going to have knock-on knock -on effects on the situation of refugees, but as well as the internally displaced. So is it time, is, are these the right moment? Is this the right moment to be talking about early recovery? Is the situation stable? Uh, what can you tell us? Uh, the short answer is that the right moment is when uh, the, uh, the situation in Syria, both on security and economy level, is, is at least livable. I mean, we're talking about really, really bad. We were talking about danger of hunger. We're talking mm -hmm. about malnutrition, massive malnutrition. Uh, 
Uh, we're talking about uh, continuous uh, uh, security violations from all sides, state and non-state uh, actors. Uh, so even if we see some degree of normalization uh, uh, or we, uh, we see more funds for early recovery, that should not be connected with, with uh, refugee return. In other words, a degree of normalization, even some sort of an advancement in the political process, uh, that does not mean that Syria will will automatically become uh, suitable for uh, for refugee return. Uh, it, it, even even more so, I think back in 2015, 16, 17, I would argue that the major problem was the security and the war situation. People were were uh, fleeing war. Uh, uh, today. Even if that security and political situation improves a bit, even hypothetically, if it improves, it improves. I think the economic situation is so dire that we will we will almost certainly not see uh, an en masse return of Syrians to uh, uh, to Syria. So, in short, we should not link these developments with uh, with refugee returns. The returns should happen when when the suitable conditions are met in in Syria. Thank you. Thank you, Armina. We'll be coming back to more of these issues, but I want to now move to Nadia Hardman. Nadia is a researcher in the Refugee and Migrants Rights Division of Human Rights Watch, monitoring and documenting human rights abuses against asylum seekers, refugees, and migrant populations. Nadia, welcome. Um, human Rights Watch put out a major return on refugee return last year, major report uh, on refugee return last year, as did Amnesty and others. Can you give us kind of a bit of your top line findings from this research and other similar works that were published at the end of the year and kind of also the top line recommendations um, that you had in this report, especially in light of what Armenad just described when it comes to the political situation. He mentioned economic security, but again, I think in that context, we also need to talk about physical security, but also questions of accountability. Does that factor in in any way? Thanks, thanks, Maha. And uh, thank you very much for, for hosting this important event. Um, and it's great to be here with uh, esteemed colleagues. Um, so yes, our, our report, Our Lives Are Like Death, this is a direct quote from one of the Syrian refugees that returned to Syria from Lebanon. Um, our Lives Are Like Death, Syrian Refugee Returns from Lebanon and Jordan. Um, this was a major report, as you've said, that we published in uh, October of last year, um, and in which I interviewed 65 Syrian refugees or their families um, when uh, the refugee in question um, died or uh, is, is still disappeared. Um, so 65 uh, refugees or, or their relatives that returned from uh, Lebanon and Jordan where they had been um, over the period of 2017 and 2021, with the majority returning in 2019 and 2020. Um, so really, it's, uh, it catalogues uh, quite a recent window of time when people returned. We looked at the reasons why, why people returned. So a large part of the report does examine conditions inside uh, Lebanon and Jordan, and um, we talked mainly to people that made, well, solely to people that made the decision to return. No one was forcibly deported um, or, or, yeah, no one uh, was forced to go back. However, in the context of Lebanon, we do consider returns coerced because of the particular um, conditions that exist inside Lebanon where people really are left with no choice but to, to consider a return to Syria. Um, but yes, yeah, so this uh, report examines the conditions and the fact that the deteriorating situation inside Lebanon and to some extent Jordan has pushed people to consider premature returns and the fact that they relied on, let's say, misinformation. Um, definitely, uh, you know, not the kind of solid information to make an informed voluntary decision to return because that information simply doesn't exist. And right now there is no reporting mechanism in place whereby an institution like UNHCR is able to provide solid information on areas and conditions of return that you see in other contexts. Um, of course, people also told me that they just wanted to, to 
go and try and reestablish themselves to try and regain their lands and um, see if they could uh, live a life of dignity inside Syria, having not been able to do that in in, in Lebanon or Jordan. Um, out of the 65 people I spoke to, half um, were men, half were women, and about half came from Lebanon and half came from Jordan. Um, and out of this number, we documented 21 cases of arbitrary arrest and detention, 17 cases of torture and detention, um, 13 cases, uh, I can't remember if it was, yeah, 13 cases of torture, sorry, and 17 cases of enforced disappearance, um, a handful of cases of kidnappings, and five extrajudicial killings. This is all outlined in, in the report in, in a lot more details. Um, I think the really important thing to note, and something which I've seen actually in a lot of country of origin information on whether there are the conditions in place um, whereby people, you know, can consider a safe return is that most people I spoke to um, did their due diligence before returning. That is to say they entered into, uh, well, they were forced to re re uh, enter into reconciliation agreements and or did security clearances and or check their names on wanted lists. All of this is to say that this um, was a practice that everyone did entered into and did not protect them on return. So I spoke to people, for example, who returned on the general security organized return process that exists um, with the Lebanese uh, GSO, um, where people, you know, submit their names and it goes through a security clearance pro uh, process, which is organized by the Lebanese GSO and the Syrian uh, government. And this um, did not protect, for example, a family who returned to Homs to and with the man was picked up on the second day by the political um, security agency and handed around various other intelligence agencies before he was arbitrarily uh, released four months later. And he was subjected to brutal instances of torture, had no idea why he'd been arrested or detained. During his interrogation session was forced to sign documents where he managed to get a glimpse of um, the name of the person that had denounced him. Um, and this pattern uh, is the one that we've documented for many years of uh, the torture and arbitrary arrest and disappearance of people inside inside Syria. But it you know, must be emphasized that this is happening to, to refugees when they return. And I think a really important headline of our report to, to underline is that, unlike I think Amnesty's report as well, we cannot identify a profile um, which will predict who will or will not face a human rights abuse on return. I mean, in summary, about a third of the people that I spoke to or their family members described grave human rights abuse or case of persecution when they returned. Of course, that doesn't mean everyone will face this, but there is a real risk. And that is why we call on um, a moratorium and a suspension of all forced returns to Syria until conditions for voluntary, informed, um, dignified returns are in place. And there are a number of different uh, considerations that, that would speak to those headlines. Um, but the point is right now, there is no profile which will protect you. You cannot rely on security clearance. Um, you cannot rely on that you know you are a woman there is no protective measure or guarantee to ensure that you will not face persecution on return and this is this is borne out by the many cases and instances that we documented um, aside from the human rights abuses which i can go into a lot of detail if 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 you want um, we also documented widespread bribery and extortion um, at checkpoints um, you know, from small amounts of money demanded to just, you know, pass through a checkpoint to vast sums of money uh, extorted to find out information um, about loved ones that were disappeared and presumably in detention. And then aside from that, as you you question the, the economic conditions, this really was uh the you know the majority experience um from everyone that i spoke to and interviewed people struggle to survive so even if they did not face the human rights abuse they could not live um and establish themselves um in dignity inside syria and as as i, I should have said from the outset everyone that we interviewed returned to regime controlled or reconciled areas um 
but yes, the they returned to find their house partially or totally destroyed, could not afford the, the cost of renovation, um, lack of electricity, you know, uh, relying on one bus per day, having to cross checkpoints, not wanting to cross checkpoints to access um, major services. And this is also part of our call that it should not just be uh, a question of no forced returns because of the risk of, of persecution, but also because of the humanitarian and economic situation inside Syria. So basically what you're saying, Nadia, is conditions for return are simply not there. Is this an issue only in uh, regime held areas or can we say the same for areas that are under various influences, whether it's Turkish, whether it's uh, the Northeast? I mean, can we say the same for other parts of Syria that are not under regime control? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And I haven't conducted the same kind of investigation in those areas. But I think the the the, the humanitarian situation in those areas is also one um, which, again, would form part of the, the findings that we have in our report, i.e. are those conditions met? Probably not where people can, you know, afford a life where humanitarian services um, and other services are in place to ensure that people, you know, have access to, to, to their basic needs. Um, I mean, I, I recently interviewed 150 Syrians that were deported from from Turkey um, mm -hmm. to to a government governorate and there you know, people <laughs> told me they 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 had no they had no means to survive. It was you know their families were were either living in tents, couldn't um, get referrals for services. So maybe uh, I mean again, you know, I I don't want to talk about findings that I haven't conducted or found myself. Um, you know, but certainly the humanitarian and economic situation would be one that would undermine uh, a safe return. Um, the risk of persecution. I'll leave it to other. Uh, members of the panel, maybe to answer that for, for non-regime areas. Okay. Th thank you, Nadia. Let me now turn then to uh, Nadine, Nadine Khashen, who is an international criminal and human rights lawyer and is also Aleph's refugee rights program lead and representing as well, uh, Double Hats, the Refugee Protection Watch Coalition. Um, Nadine, RPW, the Refugee Protection Watch Coalition, has been doing some monitoring on return and displacement conditions in the region, while Aleph has been looking at migration routes as well. Can you tell us a bit about the findings and the emerging themes that are appearing in that work? And then we'll continue a bit to some, uh, you know, to talk a bit more about UNHCR's work uh, and some of the policy and programming issues that you've been looking at particularly when it comes to UNHCR's protection monitoring of refugees and the regional work on the operational framework. Yeah, thank you, Maha. Uh, and thanks to the organizers of this uh, important event uh, for inviting me to be part of the panel. Indeed, we have uh, been doing some surveys. We, through our partner um, at Upinion, were able to conduct basically online surveys with uh, respondents both in Lebanon and those who have returned to Syria. Um, and through this RPW research, we were able to clearly identify that the situation uh, in Syria is not safe for return, as has been echoed by uh, other colleagues already on this, on this panel. And uh, unfortunately, the deteriorating situation in Lebanon is also becoming uh, more difficult for those living here to bear, especially refugees. And so some find themselves pushed to return prematurely without necessarily having accurate information about what exactly it is they're returning to. So what we found was that uh, upon, you know, for those who have returned or, are, who, or who are reluctant to return, 70% of our respondents are very much afraid that themselves or a loved one will be conscripted into the army. And 60% of respondents who are uh, in Syria now are afraid to, uh, our female respondents are afraid to leave home after dark. Uh, this indicates that there is a heavy level of SGBB uh, issues happening at the moment, and we've heard other reports that uh, you need that to you need, this. just uh, use the full full term because some of our our audience may oh, not be sorry familiar. about that. Yes. <laughs> uh, sexual and gender based violence. So uh, exactly. a lot of uh, women and girls who have returned to Syria are very much at risk of suffering some kind of sexual or gender-based violence and so are afraid to leave their homes after dark. Uh, 
Um, and we, as I was just saying, this has been confirmed by some uh, reports that others have put out, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, that in fact there seems to be um, a lot of sexual violence uh, in the country at the moment. Also, we had some individual reports of persons being arbitrarily detained. Uh, we've had con uh, reports of conscriptions and enforced disappearances. So this all goes to show that, in fact, it is not yet safe for uh, refugees to be returned to Syria. And unfortunately, a lot of Hello. 25% of our response uh, stated that they did not have accurate information about the situation before returning or uh, that they didn't have any information whatsoever. And so this has caused many to actually re-return again to Lebanon. Of course, this puts them in a very vulnerable position because in Lebanon, uh, since April 2019, anyone who enters the country after that date um, cannot obtain legal residency in the country. So this is likely why only 16% of Syrian refugees in Lebanon are actually registered. Uh, this creates all sorts of protection risks for those who are not registered, who do not have legal documentation. Not only do they have less access to humanitarian aid and services, but they also, uh, you know, sort of cannot report if anything happens to them, if they face any kind of labor exploitation, abuses, harassment, etc., because they themselves are afraid of being caught and detained and potentially deported to Syria. So this is a, a, a really big issue and adding uh, you know, insult to injury is the fact that less than 1% of uh, refugees in the country have the chance to be resettled. So we have a population of five to six million people in Lebanon and nearly 15 to 20% of that is made up of refugees. So obviously we have a heavy burden of refugees in the country um, and very few opportunities for them to be resettled or moved uh, or, uh, sorry. Okay, I'm being told that the sound quality is. Okay. Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, as I was saying, so uh, there is a very low chance of persons actually being resettled to host countries where they can have safe and uh, and secure futures. As a result of that, this sort of ties in with the research that we've been doing at Aleph on irregular migration. We've seen a rise in the various pathways that refugees are using to to access asylum in other countries. Initially, this started with. Uh, a lot, a, a large number of people who suddenly were starting to use the pathway from Lebanon to Cyprus. This was during the spring and summer of 2020. However, this route was very unsuccessful. Uh, there were many reports of pushbacks uh, of uh, on the Cypriot side of things. And because of the arrangement between Lebanon and Cyprus, the readmission agreement, uh, you know, I think Cyprus felt safe to return people to Lebanon where they would be, they must readmit them into Lebanon. But there is no guarantee that once in Lebanon that these persons would not be uh, detained and potentially deported to Syria. And this, in fact, did happen um, with our colleagues at ACHR. There were some cases documented where persons were uh, deported to Syria and then faced arbitrary detention and conscription and all sorts of uh, forms of persecution. So since that channel has not been very successful uh, for asylum seekers, they have been turning more and more to alternative pathways, and these are also very dangerous. Uh, for can you give us some yeah. yes, yeah, sorry. For instance, the route to Libya, which some, um, there are different ways of reaching Libya. Some might go directly from Le Lebanon to Libya. Others have to return to Syria and travel from there to Libya. Once in Libya, they're at the mercy of their smugglers, basically, who are the ones to determine when it is appropriate for them to try to cross to Italy. Um, this means that they are held in homes for with you know dozens of people, all you know isolated in one area, um, and they're just held there until they're given the chance to pass to Italy. But many times they're caught by the coast guards and then detained in Libya 
where the smugglers then pay a ransom for them to be released from detention. And this means that they're then again at the mercy of the smugglers. They have to pay more fees, uh, more bribes, basically, to then, uh, you know, to cover the expense of them being detained and then have another opportunity to go to Italy, which already in itself is a very dangerous journey. So that is one route that has been increasingly used. And another one is what we've many of us have heard about uh, through Belarus trying to access Poland or Lithuania. Um, mainly at the Polish side, we've seen some really horrible situations where uh, thousands of Syrian asylum seekers were caught between borders for a very long time. The majority were Syrian, but there were also people of, of different backgrounds, including Iraqi, Afghani, etc., but, um, you know, the pushbacks that they've suffered at these borders and being caught in these freezing forests between the two countries, these no man's land, over a dozen people, I think 19 people was the latest report, have actually died as a result of these conditions. And that's only the cases that we know about. Um, we've received some harrowing accounts from people who did attempt this route about the abuse they suffered. Uh, and it's really honestly nothing short of torture uh, to some extent. So, you know, I would argue that Poland by actually pushing people back into the hands of Belarusian forces where they are then being severely abused is in itself an act of refoulement. Thanks, Nadine. I mean, obviously you're describing horrific situations, uh, a horrific situation. And the problem is that this is likely to get even worse, particularly now, as we said earlier, with the Ukraine war, um, the space for refugees, Syrian and other refugees, uh, the potential of them being uh, getting some third party resettlement uh, has shrunk even further than it already was in the past. Um, and I mean, we'll, we'll come back to this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a short while. But I wanted to ask you quickly before I move to Emma, um, if you could talk a little bit about kind of if you were now to be the person who is advising on um, what a returns policy should look like or programming should look like in the region for the short to medium, what is it that we should be looking at in particular? Well, I mean, we continue to echo the point that Syria is not safe for return. Of course, people are free to return voluntarily if they so choose. But it, but to assure that these choices are well informed, we need to make sure that there's actually uh, some kind of returns monitoring mechanism. And this kind of mechanism has been implemented in, in other countries uh, where there was a large um, you know, exodus due to conflict or uh, other situations. But usually that has been run by UNHCR. And in this case, we understand that, you know, UNHCR is likely in a precarious position because it needs to be able to offer uh, services uh, and work in Syria. And it would be difficult then to be relaying accurate information about, you know, potential uh, uh, humanitarian abuses. So, but... Nonetheless, we argue in our monitoring, on our returns monitoring mechanism paper uh, for RPW, that is not for ELIF, um, that you could still implement such a monitoring mechanism with UN body oversight. So, for example, it could be uh, the High Council for Refugees or maybe with some involvement from, uh, from UNHCR not sure what form exactly that would take, but with collaborating with local CSOs and local organizations on the ground okay. who could share this kind of information. Okay, great. Um, we'll come back to the conditions, these conditions in a moment, but I want to move now to Emma, Emma Beals, um, who is a senior advisor at the European Institute of Peace and a non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, DC. Emma, clearly, the whole issue, I mean, the, the refugee crisis is a humanitarian crisis, uh, is a, sorry, of, is, a, is a political crisis, but of, as, of a humanitarian nature. We've been talking about this for years, um, but the political aspect of it has not been focused enough. I mean, it's striking to me just from listening to the speakers before you, uh, the extent to which a lot of the findings continue not only to be relevant, but have obviously become even worse than when we conducted our own research on refugee return, which was like, what, four or five years ago. 
So can you tell us a little bit more about the current political challenges around refugee return in the region uh, and beyond and how you think the Ukraine crisis is likely to impact those? Thanks, Maha, and, and thanks for um, being here to, to all the other yeah. panelists and, and also those um, watching. I mean, I, I think Emma is our partner in crime in this event, so <laughs> I, I <laughs> and think many the, other events. <laughs> I think that um, political challenges have been growing for a while, and then obviously Ukraine has really compounded some of those. I mean, we know that the region has a challenging history with refugee hosting and, and certainly the length of any such arrangements, um, you know, and we are in, in sort of the 11th year of the conflict. So those are, you know, becoming more and more relevant. So, um, we, you know, when we talk about the ongoing necessity to host Syrians in Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, we're not coming at this from kind of a neutral position necessarily. Um, and then even in Europe, there were sort of a lot of political ripples caused by the so-called refugee crisis in 2015. And rightly or wrongly, there are many that are actively trying to avoid repeating that. So that's a big political consideration there. So from a range of actors, we have sort of a growing impatience on the issue of refugee hosting. And I think that has grown, you know, we heard earlier about the reduction in, in violence, which has really um, exacerbated some of that Im impatience in the two years since March 2020, when that kind of began. Though I think it's important to note, as we've heard from other speakers, that the security posture of the regime towards the population hasn't changed. And sort of use, only really using forced dis disappearances and so forth as a measure of those risks um, does have some sort of uh, limitations. Because if we look at the number of, of new groups of population to be uh, made available, if you will, or, or to come into contact with the regime's security, um, that has diminished as the reconciliations have taken place and so forth. So we would expect there to have been a reduction in those, given that there is not necessarily new groups of people um, for interacting with the government because of the really small return numbers to date. And so, you know, if we were to see a massive increase in returns, I would expect to see a massive increase in, in some of those um, uh, more problematic outcomes that people are having, you know, really risky uh, uh, sort of terrible um, events that are occurring. Um, because what we know from our research, at least, is that their posture towards the towards the um, population hasn't changed. And I think that's just worth, you know, uh, mentioning again. So, but paradoxically, with all of that sort of impatience, we're nowhere near any kind of political solution that would bring about the changes that are described in 2254 and would sort of therefore kickstart the creation of the conditions that are described in the UNHCR protection thresholds. So, you know, hosting states and, and some of the more impatient European states are being asked to continue their role until those conditions exist, but they can also see those conditions are not very likely. And then politically, we have elections coming up in both Lebanon and Turkey, and we're, we're either seeing or are worried about seeing the politicization of this issue in those states within their domestic political affairs, and that will obviously have an impact on the lives of refugees in one way or another. And then in Europe, we're beginning to see kind of paradoxical political positions from, for example, Denmark, who have a foreign policy position regarding the government in the Syrian conflict that is pretty much incompatible with their immigration policies. We also have funders more prepared to pay for programming inside of Syria that does tie return to ERL work, even though we heard from, from your colleague earlier that, you know, those things should not really be um, tied Can together. I and obviously, we also heard a bit about this earlier, that the regime in Russia know that returns is an issue they can exploit. And they've been trying since 2018 um, when Russia came with their first returns plan. And they've pushed conferences and proposals and so forth since then. And the regime stood up at UNGA even like late last year to say, yes, we want everybody to return, but I think it's important to see that their actions speak far louder than their words here. Because they both do understand that that's a way to win some favor politically, as well as to gain access to increased funding, um, you know, because they have always hoped that that, that uh, reconstruction funding would come from um, external states. And then Ukraine is, of course, creating huge numbers of refugees into Europe in particular. And so those returns are, are uh, increasing, right? Um, so one concern is that European states might speed up discussions about when Syrians could return, you know, to balance that new influx. 
While regional states, I think I'm really worried that the funding that they depend on to continue that hosting will decrease um, or will decrease even more rapidly than they have been during to, due to those sort of stretched budgets. And so politically, there's a real vulnerability in a lot of these places. So when we see actors jumping in with returns as part of their set of ambitions for their normalization or Damascus engagements, that helps those to be seen more favorably or less unfavorably. Mm -hmm. um, and if you note, like a lot of those leading the charge on normalization have really tied return into their narrative or their reasoning, though to date we sort of know that they're not really had much luck in terms of getting traction for any behavior change on, you know, that would be necessary to facilitate any return or even behavior change on other issues that they've been talking about, such as sort of Captagon exportation, exportation for example. But what we're not really seeing in all of that is kind of a sensible discussion of the political pathway to resolving the issues around mm -hmm. um, what the conditions might be for eventual return. Uh, absolutely, Emma. Uh, I actually recall when one of the Russian proposals around return was actually being quantified by how many metric tons, I think, of concrete was needed. Um, and they were. It was uh, very much of a coffee table kind of calculation around uh, around what it would require. Let me let me come back to you with a follow up question. I mean, you say that refugees require a political solution. Can you perhaps elaborate a bit on what that could look like from your perspective? Right. Um, sure. Happy to. I mean, so we, <laughs> we, we, we know this. So it's a topic of uh, endless discussions. Exactly. Plus, exactly. I want to come back to you later, Emma, on the issue of what this means. I mean, it, when you talk about the political solution, uh, you also spoke about elections coming up in a number of neighboring countries. The idea yeah, that Nadine mentioned where you have a population of four and a half million and then another million uh more or less of Syrian refugees. So the burden is significant, especially now in the aftermath of COVID and in the, in the context of Lebanon, you have a complete economic collapse. So as you reflect on the political conditions, it would be great also if you could tie it into what that means for host countries today. And before you answer, I just want to kind of give a say to the audience out there who's watching, if they'd like to ask a question, please send it in and we'll uh, of any of the panelists and I'll be happy to relay it to them. So go ahead. Uh, right. So, I mean, we, we have a framework for what safe, voluntary and dignified refugee return is supposed to look like. There's con 22 conditions um, were laid out in 2018 in the UNHCR's protection thresholds. Mm -hmm. And so those are, um, you know, relatively comprehensive, not as comprehensive as some would like, too comprehensive for others. But, you know, they, they do cover a range of, of the issues. Mm -hmm. Some of them are more bureaucratic in nature. Some of them are about access to documents or information about conditions back at someone's area of origin. But a lot of them are conditions that are about security or political considerations. So, you know, the UNHCR has no more capable of securing the legal, physical and material security of returnees in, in Syria mm -hmm. than you or I are. Um, and this is kind of where we come to, to a problem. So they can tell us whether those conditions exist, if they were able to monitor them, which they're not. Um, but they can't create it. You know, they can they can busy themselves with some of the more bureaucratic ones, but certainly not those. So achieving some of these conditions does require a lot of legal and behavioral changes on behalf of the regime. Um, and we can define what those are. So, you know, when we're talking about returns, we do tend to get stuck, you know, in parts of the narrative about, mm -hmm. you know, is there a reduction in violence? Was someone arrested when they went home or not? you know, can you and HCR monitor? And those are all really important parts of the discussion. But the other part is what are the changes that are needed to create those conditions and how can exactly. we create those? And so for the most part, securing them is going to require political concessions from the government, most likely from a negotiation or an external process. So don't imagine they will wake up one day and think that they should implement them wholesale without some suggestions uh, from others. So utilizing the Geneva process, the bilaterals from some of the actors who are moving forward with sort of direct discussions with Damascus, you know, all of those kinds of forums, and there's more than one of them, 
should or will certainly need to at some point focus on these changes and gain an agreement from the government to make these changes and to create these conditions. So when I talk about refugee returns needs a political solution, that's what I'm talking about. You know, there's all this excellent work going on on all of these, you know, components around monitoring, documentation, analysis, programming, and that's all super important. But there is also this additional higher level piece. And I think, you know, let's not forget when we're talking about some of the countries that do have these large hosting responsibilities, um, Lebanon has been talking directly to the government of Syria about returns. They have, you know, been looking at documents together and agreeing on some of them. And so they do have an opportunity in those conversations to be highlighting what the conditions are and that, you know, as as countries who are engaged in a conversation, that it, they would expect some of those changes to be made. And, and the, what those changes are isn't a mystery to them. You know, it's not a secret document that that is only used to stop Lebanon from returning people that, you know, those documents are available to them as well. And they could be part of a range of voices that are politically sort of engaged in trying to create those conditions in order that some of those other um, things can eventually happen, you know, but we, we do need to start somewhere. And I think that discussing what those conditions are and how to create them really is, is, is a better place to start than this kind of binary of, you know, is it time yet or not? Couldn't agree with you more. And the problem is, I don't think I see the political um, window yet uh, to have these kinds of a discussion uh, in, a, in a kind of a serious way. But uh, I'll, I'll come back to this later with you, Emma, maybe in a bit. But just to uh, move a little bit to uh, get a the point of view of someone who himself was uh, displaced. Uh, Mohanad al Husseini is a Syrian doctor who has served on Syria's local councils and the board of the KM Foundation and is a member of the uh, SACT's diplomatic outreach team. Uh, Mohanad, first I want to ask you what you think about what has been said. Welcome to, 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 to this panel. I'm glad you're joining, you've joined us. But first I wanted to ask you what you think of what has been said so far and kind of maybe if you could reflect a little bit uh, as someone who's had to personally deal with a lot of the issues, what are the personal, the common, the most common barriers to return for refugees and IDPs? Okay, thank you, man. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Actually, uh, most of the points are, are accurate and uh, maybe we have some hints about some issues re related to the security issue inside the inside the, uh, the regime held areas and also the economic issue has that how that affect the decision of the people to return to Syria but here let me just try to answer the question that you just mentioned about the barriers for the people to return to Syria I believe actually after the 11 years of Syrian crisis with these disastrous outcomes with displacement of more than half of the population of uh, Syria with hundreds and maybe thousands of massacres all, all over the country with interventions from many regional and international powers, the main and the most important obstacle to the safe, dignified return is the way Syrians, the displaced here, are seen by the international community. Syrians have been dehumanized for years by Russia, Iran, and the regime, resulting in uh, disastrous uh, uh, outcomes and suffering. At the, at the same time, the rest of the world's neglect is explicit in preventing necessary solutions, sustainable solutions based on rights uh, uh, which are supposed to be universal from being implemented. We can see how so swiftly such solutions have been put into action directly in Ukraine. But in the case of Syria, we are still suffering and far from it. Mentioning the direct and obvious obstacles like security and other obstacles to return, which I'll, I'll go through it in a while, shouldn't lead us to ignore other important realities that are indirectly contributing to the same problem. The Syrian crisis has been dealt so far by focusing on the consequences rather than the root causes, with the lack of comprehensive view and uh, genuine intention to intervene for the benefit of the people's rights, as we saw in the Ukraine uh, case. Uh, 
to begin for uh, uh, some points, uh, the steps that we are seeing from, uh, from some parties to normalize the regime that's responsible with his allies for horrible destruction of cities in Syria, forced the population and attempting to consolidate the demographic changes in, in many parts of Syria will surely put an end to any hope of the displaced returning in the, uh, in the way we aim. The steps are not aimed to normalize the, uh, the remaining parts of the regime in Syria, rather they are aimed to normalize Russia's gains and presence in Syria and making Russia's military victory over Syrian civilians real and stable. This is the same Russia that's currently destroying Mariupol and other cities in Ukraine, just as it has been doing for many other cities in, and towns in Syria for years, with no efforts by anybody to, to stop this. The second, some host countries approach the issue to, of return from their own perspective, based on incorrect assessments and internal politics uh, that put more pressure on the displays that uh, and cause premature return in some cases. For example, Denmark uh, withdraw protection from Denmark, Damascus and Damascus countryside refugees, despite all reliable reports stating that there is no safe area in Syria. The Danish authorities have not changed the policy until now, despite the fact that it violates the EU regulations and, uh, and principles. And, and also, and actually, it's in line with the Russia's interest in Syria. Uh, instead, our information that Denmark plans to expand the assessment to other areas uh, of Syria. Turkey as well could be another example, as pressure of the refugees rises day by day due to the internal politics issue. Uh, uh, Lebanon also, we all know that a lot of attempts to push the refugees to return to unsafe Syria in many ways as well. Uh, as well. So uh, all the preceding points, uh, uh, I think it's, ob it's obvious that there is n currently no comprehensive political solution based on the rights of the Syrian people. And as we all know, political discourse is not going well. And unfortunately, unfortunately the focus has, on, uh, has been on, on complementary uh, uh, elements such as uh, constitutional committee or on uh, fruitless ways such as uh, the step-by-step -step approach. These sit situations and issues will lead to consolidation of displacement both inside and outside Syria and reduce the possibility of real, safe and voluntary dignified return over time. I just want to go for, for a few points regarding the, the, the direct obstacles, which is the security. I think okay. that our colleagues talk a little bit about it and which is the most important point that's prevent the people from returning to Syria. And, uh, and, and actually, uh, I, uh, for example, in a survey we did in, uh, with 1,100 Syrians outside the regime, areas in 2020, 84% of people interviewed in this survey said that compulsory recruitment in the regime's army is a major obstacle to return. A security were the most prominent cause for Syrians leaving their homes since 2012. And practices like arbitrary and illegal detention, kidnapping, enforced disappearance, and financial extortion continue to this day by the security apparatus of the regime. For example, uh, the SNHR announced that in its latest report that mm -hmm. it documents at least 173 arbitrary arrests, detentions just in March 2022. Just to explain to the audience, SNHR is the Syrian National Syrian Network for Human Rights. Human Rights. Okay, yes. exactly. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, for, including four children and five women. And uh, the, the report, which is I think uh, 24 pages, talking, uh, speaking in details about about uh, uh, the, the violations of human of, of human rights and what's going on and uh, the uh, the the ways that the security apparatus dealing with the people there. Okay. The here we can talk a little bit about the reconciliation agreements that the Russia and regime try to be to to do it as a model for return to the. To, to, uh, for the people. And we today, we can th clearly see that these agreements it completely fail to protect the basic li living conditions. Okay. Uh, uh, also, also uh, 
besides the, the security uh, uh, obstacles, of course, there is a living conditions. And, and uh, I mean, uh, that's the, the deterioration of the living conditions also make a great deal to the people uh, preventing them to return, as well as the economic deterioration. And our, our, our reports, the normalization of horror, uh, we, we published, I think, in uh, last year, we talk a a in details about the conditions and the, sorry, uh, um, I just want Nella, to say. I just, yeah, if we could just, because I want, there are some questions coming up from the audience and I want to go back to some of the other members of the panel as well. Okay, okay. Maybe that's the last, uh, the last point that Syria under the current regime and its allies, Russia and Iran, has become a hub for drug trade, corruption, militias, which work not just threaten the lives of, Syrians, but also destabilize the whole region. That surely will prevent any kind of real uh, voluntary and dignified retain in the eyes of uh, Syrian displaced. So basically, uh, in short, without a political solution um, that includes some sort of a, a new governance system, so, so this is not to say regime change, but some sort of a new different governance system in Syria, the conditions for return will rem remain practically uh, non-existent for a safe and dignified return, is what you're saying. And it's not just about the humanitarian and the economic, but also about the security, uh, exactly. the, the, uh, the, the legal framework, which we still haven't really talked about. But uh, before we, we get to that, I want to go back to both, uh, and I'll come back to you, Mohanad, in a, in a bit, because I'd like to also talk about the conditions that you would like to see in place. If you were to run, return, what would you like to see in place? But we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. Um, there's a question from Kevin McDonnell, um, who's asking, as a French citizen, citizen, he says, how can we apply pressure on our political readership in order for our institutions to treat exiles from other countries other than Ukraine as fairly? Um, I'm going to turn this question to you, uh, and then uh, maybe others will want to come in, Armenak or others. But there's also, we'll come back, there's also another question on that is related because it also asks about the uh, whether the Ukraine, uh, it's from Joy, uh, and she asks, do you think that the Ukrainian refugee crisis could reshift the discourse on Syrian refugees, which is something you talked about, Emma, and whether the backlash would become, uh, that has emerged, would make countries more cautious when they raise the question of return. So... In other words, that perhaps could be a positive thing. So, Emma, let me start with you in response to the two questions, and then we'll move to other members of the panel. Um, well, I think it's important to start with the similarity. So what we've seen from a lot of the, the states that have taken in Ukrainian refugees is that they have actually been um, offered a two-year kind of automatic temporary protected status um, kind of, of situation, which basically means they do not need to argue their individual uh, threshold for, for requiring protection. They are, mm -hmm. by definition of, of arriving from this place, assumed to be somebody in need of protection. Um, now, the UNHCR's recommendations about uh, serious displaced is that, you know, there there is an assumption of the need for protection still. And in, in their documents, this is what they've said. And a lot of um, European states in 2015 actually offered the same kind of temporary protection um, on a blanket basis uh, to Syrian refugees. And so there are some similarities in the approach, but what we're actually seeing in, in some European countries, be it Denmark or, or, or elsewhere actually, is a shift away from this kind of blanket temporary protected status to the need to argue individual cases on the basis of their um, asylum case. And this is where I think we, we, we can get into interpretation. Some countries are saying that they do still believe that, you know, almost by definition of um, coming from, from Syria at this time, those requesting that asylum that higher sort of threshold of protection should receive it, right? Because I think most of the folks on this panel would find it difficult to find, you know, as, as Nadia mentioned, any particular group where you could argue that they were not able to reach those thresholds, right? Like there are, mm -hmm. name the group of people that you think 
wouldn't require that level of protection. It's very, very difficult. You, almost any identity group or background or situation, you can sort of make the case that they do reach those higher levels of protection. And so I think that the, a lot of what's kind of beginning to be degraded, aside from Denmark, which is obviously a very particular case, is actually happening in that area around um, blanket and temporary versus um, individual and, and a much higher uh, uh protection actually because if you do get the proper refugee protection then you have you know more longevity of your ability to stay in a country and so on mm -hmm. so i think you know encouraging um folks to understand that people do need that higher protected uh, status um and, and and that there's almost no group that wouldn't reach those thresholds i think is probably one of the more fruitful places to have that conversation because the security conditions still exist in the problematic way because it isn't actually necessarily related to levels of conflict violence for most syrians then actually um you know they they do meet those thresholds and so i think that that is you know the the sort of from a policy perspective the 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 through road there in terms of you know, uh, getting making sure people have the protection that they need to be able to go on and actually live a life where they're not fearful of of being returned or fearful of of you know the bureaucracy questioning um, why they're there, which is also a whole other set of issues that people face, which is you know extremely difficult. Okay, Armina, do you want to come in on those two questions? Uh, no, Maha, I think I will. I would like to make an intervention regarding the third question. Uh, so, if that's possible, which I haven't I asked have yet, any... is that about the European government's one? Okay, yeah. then let me ask that question, and then I'll come back to the panelists if they want to come in on the yeah. other questions. Um, there was a question from Kins Kinzat uh, Kniazat asking, what can European governments do better, if anything, to promote better conditions for displaced Syrians inside and outside Syria? Uh, I mean, yeah. the, the questions are more or less linked, but the first two are focused more on the Ukraine crisis and the kind of knock-on effects of the Ukraine crisis. So do you want me to reflect on the third question? Yeah. Okay. Reflect on the third question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, what can I think realistically European governments and the aid community in general, they need to be prepared for a protracted uh, refugee uh, crisis. I think the crisis has been there for 10 years, but it's not going to end uh, uh, anytime soon. I think this is a painful but a realistic uh, a scenario and I, in my opinion, the most, uh, uh, the most likely scenario. For a number of reasons, I will mention just uh, uh, two or three very, very quickly. First of all, I think the main uh, conflict actors in Syria, whether that's the regime or the uh, HDS in the Northwest or the Turkish influenced areas or the Northeast, I don't think there is an appetite to, uh, to welcome hundreds of thousands of refugees. That's uh, for, for security reasons, uh, et cetera, but, but now also for humanitarian and economic reasons. I mean, uh, feeding people, providing electricity, providing water is a major uh, issue everywhere in Syria, regime areas or outside regime areas. So I don't think, to begin with, uh, the main actors inside Syria, they don't want uh, um, a massive uh, refugee return. Uh, the, the, the second uh, second problem is that uh, even if there was a, a political change in Syria, whether that's uh, a, President Assad and the regime, you know, solidifying their control in Syria, or there is a, as you mentioned, uh, a new governance uh, system. That may be a positive sign towards refugee return in the long term, but in the short term, I don't think that will uh, uh, change much. I mean, look at areas which are outside uh, regime control. They, they also don't have any pool factors to attract uh, Syrian refugees or IDPs to, uh, to go back. Um, and, and finally, um, I think uh, pressuring the regime to change uh, one of the fundamentals that it's based on, which is its own security, you know, the security services and the way the regime operates, I think is a, uh, it, it is a uh, wishful thinking, uh, unfortunately. So that's why uh, we need to, the best we could do, I think, for Syrians who are outside, is to prepare to you know help them assist them especially in the region especially in lebanon jordan turkey 
and uh, and Iraq, so they can uh, do, so they can have a relatively more dignified life outside, outside Syria. Thanks, Armanak. <coughs> Sorry, let me go back to um, Nadine and see if you would like to come in on all of on any of the questions, and then I will put out a fourth question as well in a second. Sure, uh, I I totally agree with what Armanak has just said. I mean, if we expand the protection space here in Lebanon, uh, such that people are able to at least meet their basic needs and and have some level of stability, that would lend much more to to voluntary returns. In which case, we could feel a bit more secure in knowing that those who are returning are doing so because that is their actual wish and not because the situation uh, is not allowing them to survive in Lebanon. Um, not only that, but with the economic collapse here in Lebanon, I mean, there's a huge population now of Lebanese and refugees that are vulnerable and need this extra support. So by increasing our support to local organizations, especially uh, that are embedded in the community, such as Elif, that is an advocacy organization, such as our partners, uh, in, in our many networks, because these, these organizations are truly embedded in the communities they serve. They're best able to identify the needs of their beneficiaries and how to meet them. And so I think improving uh, our localization efforts, including uh, improving funding to local organizations, uh, would go a long ways towards creating some stability for the time being. Thanks. Nadia, would you like to weigh in on these questions, the ones Ukraine created and then uh, the last one on uh, how can we pr promote better conditions in Europe? Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, look, I want to say, I guess, at the outset, what, you know, unintended consequence, I think, of the Ukraine refugee crisis um, has caused and, you know, may threaten to continue to cause, which is, uh, a differentiation in the class of refugee. At the moment, it looks like, you know, Ukrainian refugees and others, <laughs> um, unfortunately not. This is a, a bit of a sweeping statement, but definitely in the discourse, you, you have seen a shift, and I mean this very much in Europe, where um, in 2015, you know, the media and elsewhere and governments talked about the uh, a refugee crisis. It was a crisis for Lebanon, uh, potentially, and it was a crisis maybe for, for neighboring countries where they were dealing with lots and lots of refugees, not for Europe. Yet now Europe, you know, is using different language. You don't hear the language of, of you know, a, a wave, a tide of refugees. And all of this is a good thing. But what you are also seeing is differential treatment. Um, you know, just to give you an example, in Denmark, which has a self-professed no asylum policy, um, is now prepared to welcome Ukrainian refugees, having taken away protection from Syrian refugees in the last few years, now is suspending laws which apply to uh, other asylum seekers. For example, in Denmark, you can seize the assets of uh, an asylum seeker to fund their stay in Denmark. That law has been suspended in the context of Ukrainian refugees. Um, we still have a situation on the Belarus-Polish -Po border where Syrians and others are right now are trying desperately to get into Poland. Um, and yet Poland has opened its door, you know, its borders wide open for Ukrainian refugees. And this is, again, good. We welcome the... the, the um, the actions, the the first ever trigger of the temporary protection directive in Europe, as as Emma outlined, happened for the Ukrainian refugee crisis. It's just that we cannot forget that there are other humanitarian crises all over the the world, and that we need to keep uh, in the the central agenda and arena. And this is, I guess, my fear. I know it's a fear of others who work in the migration sector, which is why we need to continue to have events like this. And just because it's 11 years since the Syrian conflict does not mean that there are conditions in place. Time does not reduce uh, a, a refugee's need for protection. And, and until we see, and you brought this up in your intro, accountability to the extent necessary and conditions for return where voluntariness and you know the, the risk of persecution is eliminated, we cannot talk about safe Syrian returns. 
I'm not sure if I answered all the question, but that was just <laughs> my No, my but actually answer. your point is great about this idea of having, I mean, a situation now where we're looking at different classes of refugees. Uh, and in fact, that was one of the backlashes, uh, if you want the negative backlashes of the, or response reactions um, to the amazing response that, uh, not only response actually, but even media coverage of the uh, refugee, Ukrainian refugee crisis. As you recall, some of the language that was being used around Ukrainian refugees, oh, you know, they're blonde, they're blue eyed, they look like us. Um, just indicated the kind of mindset, at least amongst some people. And the concern that this could become even more and more uh, ingrained is, I think, you're absolutely right to point, point out that out. Mohanad, let me come back to you um, just on the uh, a question that's been raised by Anne uh, Fleischer, and she's asking, how can we shift the conversation away from question, the question around presence of conditions for return towards a more meaningful conversation led by Syrians themselves. Okay, thank you. Actually, I think that's that's a very important question and maybe that's uh, we uh, that's the point that we have to concentrate on to uh, to to think about the solution by the Syrians themselves and that's what we are aiming for which is a comprehensive political solution based on the rights of the people. The rights that uh, we can achieve by creating a safe environment inside Syria that has a condition for the people to return, which is the right for them to return to their own, own places. But if we didn't start from this point, I mean to create the safe environment with the conditions in the eyes of the people, the Syrian people themselves, and to engage them directly in the political solution discussions, I think that we are uh, away from any kind of stability in the region and any kind of return in the near future. So how do we change the conversation, though? What do we need to do to shift the conversation in Europe uh, around these issues? Maybe let me ask you, Armenak, to respond to this uh, a little bit. And um, I'm, I'm going to tag on. I, I keep tagging on more than one question, but that's fine. We'll, 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 everybody's free to make a few. I'll, I'll, I'll give you all the space to kind of do some concluding remarks at the end. But Arminak, there's a question from Gate Solutions saying, do you think that we can solve uh, some of the co complex problems in the Middle East, mm -hmm. what people drives to other countries, or well, what drives people to other countries, if we give Iran a deal, uh, a real alternative uh, to come back on the world market and lift sanctions? So basically, the, the uh, Gate Solutions is asking, would a JCPOA help us resolve other complex problems in the region? Well, in this particular case, we're talking about Syria. Your yeah, thoughts again, I, yeah. Uh, again, I think on the uh, it, it will be. I mean, depending who you ask, some welcome the JCPOA, <laughs> some not. Some say that uh, Iran's support to you know its non-state actors in Syria or the Syrian regime will increase. Uh, some say the services uh, like fuel and electricity could improve. It's it's difficult to assess exactly how how it will uh, uh, impact. But I think what's what's sure that on the short uh, uh, term, uh, uh, like less sanctioned uh, uh, Iran uh, will will not necessarily make uh, Syrians um, you know uh, return to Syria. On the long run, things might change. But I think now we're concerned in the coming years the challenges are enormous and I don't think that will make a big difference. Will it resolve, will it allow us to resolve some of the more complex challenges in the region? It's not just about, I mean, it's more about the political. Will a JCPOA help solve the, uh, or help address part of the complexity of the Syrian crisis? Yeah, yeah I think on the, on the political level, uh, it, uh, it could, because basically, uh, the um, uh, I mean, what, what what we what we're hoping at least is less aggressive uh, Iranian policy uh, in Syria, especially now that the Russian 
the Russian role has uh, has regressed to some degree because they are stuck in uh, in Ukraine, and there are a lot of fears that Iran Iran could feel the uh, the gap existing in in Syria, not only from the economic perspective but also uh, militarily. But the JCPOA, which I would argue that Iranians are quite eager to have that uh, agreement. Uh, uh, could you know could could show us less aggressive uh, Iran in uh, in Syria, which will in turn please the other camp. Basically, you have several Arab states trying to pull Syria back from the Iranian uh, sphere, and also Israel, although not not very uh, uh, publicly. So we we might see less aggressive Iran. Uh, in in Syria, which is, in my opinion, uh, uh, good. But solving all the least problems <laughs> with one JCPOA, <laughs> that would be a, a dream. Yeah. Well, the idea, I think, the the, the issue here is that the, the Iran nuclear deal is not uh, directly connected to a lot of the issues in the region. And the, Iraq, the JCPOA is very focused on the nuclear activities on, of Iran, and, but it does not include Iran's activities in the region, uh, many, of, many, of, many of which are quite malign. And I think this is where many may disagree with you, Armanak, that a JCPOA may, as good as it is in terms of containing Iraq's nuclear uh, potential, at least for a for limited time, uh, may in fact release some of the pressure and some of the funding and allow it to augment and increase its activities in the region. And that, that there is a lot of concern around that, including Syria. Um, let me, uh, Emma, come back to you um, just on the question again. There's a question of where would the funding come from? I'm assuming that funding for you know, resettlement of refugees, uh, but also early recovery. This is by uh, Laura Santiago. Um, but um, yeah, I'm assuming that's the context of this question. Right. I think it also ties helpfully into the what can European governments do better, if anything, yeah. kind of question as well. And I think we have an opportunity um, coming up. And how can we shift the conversation, I think? Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting you, but I think the idea is how can we shift the conversation away from, you know, yeah. the question of conditions to a more meaningful conversation led by Syrians and others? Yeah, so I think, you know, using Brussels as an opportunity to make those funding commitments, it's going to be a moment where um, regional actors are looking for that reassurance, right, that those pledges are going to come through. It's going to be a really big opportunity to make sure that we can, uh, or that European states and, and other major funders can help to, you know, reassure those those who have these huge um, sort of hosting responsibilities that that support continues, that they're not being sort of uh, forgotten about. And I think making sure that they understand the funding is coming in that public forum is going to be uh, really important. And there's something certainly that European states can do. Um, ensuring that um, early recovery work inside of Syria to help alleviate the, the terrible conditions mm -hmm. is not tied to returns. It, there are reasons that there is support required for communities inside of Syria based on need alone tying you know these other uh issues into it it, it should should sort of uh, not occur we've heard that a couple of times today um solidifying protection and resettlement in european countries i think is important because when you know it, it, it's no secret that when we see denmark doing what denmark is doing um it does make all of the other conversations more difficult right because <laughs> you're you're then having a much more challenging time trying to uh speak to some of the states that have just a much larger hosting responsibility mm -hmm. if, if mm -hmm. some of the states that have the small ones and also quite aggressive political positions are really not living up to what they said you know and increasing the resettlement as, as a part of that, I think is another thing that they can really be doing, um, you know, actively. And I think, you know, it's it's a more appropriate for the Syrians to speak to how to meaningfully um, include them in this process. Um, <laughs> the only thing I would say that I think programmatically there is more space for organizations um, like the UNHCR and so forth to be making sure as per their sort of um, own policies and practices that um, the voices of, um, Syrians are included in all of their kind of um, consultative processes in a, in a meaningful way, in a proper way, where they are actually really um, listened to as part of that. 
Thanks, Emma. Um, we're nearing the end of the panel. What I'm going to do now is ask each of you to say a couple of comments, sort of closing remarks on uh, whatever of the, any of the issues that have come up or points you wanted to make and didn't manage yet to make. Let me start with you, Nadia. Thank you. On the spot is the final word. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think it's just really to reiterate what um, the Human Rights Watch returns report position is, which is, you know, there should be no returns, no facilitated and forced returns at this time, um, that uh, resettlement spaces um, should increase for Syrian refugees, um, that the situation is not conducive to um, free, informed and voluntary returns right now. Uh, we hope and call on uh, UNHCR to maintain its position that it will not facilitate and promote returns and that funders and donor governments should really not inadvertently um, or advertently uh, encourage returns based programming at this time. Thanks, Nadia. Nadine? Yes, I would agree with all of that. And of course, reiterate that we need to expand the protection space in Lebanon. We need to increase uh, funding to refugee hosting countries in the region, but also that, you know, our uh, European uh, stakeholders and governments need to be setting the example of adhering to human rights, respecting the right to seek asylum and uh, the principle of non-refoulement. Thank you, Nadine. Armenak? Uh, thanks, Noha. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think the world, especially U Europe and the US, as they are the biggest donors uh, to Syrian uh, organizations who help Syrian refugees, they have a responsibility not to forget the, that the Syrian refugee crisis is, is going on, uh, despite the tragedy uh, of Ukraine. And, and again, it is unlikely that there will be an en masse return to, uh, to Syria. Therefore, they uh, need to be uh, you know, uh, ready to uh, to continue and sustain their their support to Syrian refugees, especially in the uh, in the neighboring countries around Syria. Okay. In other words, the crisis is only going to get worse. Emma, I think I covered most of my wrap up in that last comment. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll rest my case. Okay. <laughs> Mohanad, Miskil Khitem. Last but not least, I'd like to give you the final word on. Uh, and okay. what, what you see. Okay, actually, I think that the safe environment uh, is, is essential and, uh, and the cornerstone and fundamental in any, in any political solution. Safe environment is not a broad concept. We are working on a, a position paper to illustrate that exactly uh, this is step by step, a roadmap how to achieve a safe environment inside Syria before and during and after the return. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's essential for any uh, hope for the people to return to Syria. At the same time, leaving Syria to Putin and Khamenei will result in nothing, actually, result in destability and uh, continue waves of displacement uh, um, with no hope for any return in the near future. Can you give us a hint of what this, uh, you know, what are the maybe bullet points or highlights of what this uh, plan would look like? Uh, actually, actually, uh, after after holding a long and detailed discussions with Syrians and international experts, collecting data, integrating mm -hmm. ideas of Syrians, providing statistics and facts about the reality on Syria and studying examples from other countries as well who, who, ha who have experienced uh, the same massive displacement and destructive wars. We are about, I mean, SACD, Syrian Association for Citizens and Dignity, are about to publish a, that position paper which translate all that effort and uh, defining the safe environment as a reality in Syria, uh, providing the key actors with the roadmap how to do it step by step Actually, the measures and the changes need to be implemented in that way, including detailed legal organized point related to rights of freedom, armed forces in Syria, security services, property rights, and judiciary, the legal system, international monitoring and supervision and accountability. And actually, when we describe the political solution, the safe environment will undoubtedly uh, include many details, such as the following. Syrian army, uh, uh, that's neutral and sectarian national army whose mission is to defend the country, exemption from military conscription for returnees uh, uh, for minimum period of five years at least, uh, 
security services integrated in one single non-sectarian service that's neutral towards all, unified, uh, single unified judicial system uh, exercising its function all over the, the Syrian territory in a neutral, independent, and transparent way, uh, abolishment of any laws that undermine the human rights and public uh, freedom, restitution of properties lost or seized since 2011, as well as any other property seized period to that date for, uh, for direct or indirect political reasons, uh, a return to the uh, pre-displacement homes uh, free uh, of uh, the risk of harassment, and the abolishment of all exceptional courts, including counter-terrorism court, field martial court, and amnesty for those convicted by these courts, and many other points which is discussed in very detailed way, in a legal way, with organized, we, 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 we are going to publish it and both the policy maker, makers and main stakeholders in, uh, so that maybe we can find a roadmap for the return to Syria. And just finally, I just want to add an, uh, the last point here that as we discussed reshaping the, at least I suggest reshaping the political solution, I believe that it's an important point to consider the rules of the key actors on Syrian soil. Because Syrians have seen the disastrous consequences of Russian intervention for many years, it's critical to redefine Russia's rule. It's unacceptable to be seen as a guarantor in Syria, while also being viewed as a war criminal, uh, criminal in, in Ukraine, where uh, it engaged in the same brutal and disastrous uh, behavior in both. That's from my side. Thank you, Mohanad. Um, thank you all for a very fascinating discussion. Unfortunately for all of us, I think, and we will have to continue this conversation because as we, I think we have all agreed, the, the conditions for uh, a safe and dignified return to Syria are far, very, still very far off. Uh, and there needs to be a lot more work to make that possible. Uh, down the road, uh, particularly beginning with a political solution and then moving to the humanitarian and other conditions around return. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, and uh, until the next time, I would say. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.